starting right now. Okay, so this very quickly is the pilot project that we're working on. It's a competency-based program, and I would like to start with a Im couple important uh, distinctions about what we're doing for this competency-based program because they're not all the same. There's a lot of different ways to do competency-based, and our interest is in a program where the students um, get credit when they demonstrate mastery of explicit competencies. We're using regular courses. We're not. We're not. Um, exploding the courses that we use right now into uh, competencies and then transcribing those competencies, which is, are some of the experimental programs that are going on right now. We're not doing that. Instead, we are um, students are enrolling in and getting credit in the very recognizable five credit courses that we already use. But in order to get that credit, they have to demonstrate mastery at a level of 80% or better of all the, the competencies that are listed for that course. And in order to um, help students do that, they'll be working at their own pace, but they'll receive constant support based on their learning needs, and that includes regular interaction with uh, faculty who are qualified to teach those courses and also with a completion coach. So our goal here is to flip the way that we manage uh, how, how we count learning. Right now we, we have a quarter-based system and at the end of the quarter you take a test and either you pass the test or you don't. Um, you get credit or you don't. You get a grade or you don't. But the learning is, you know, is then uh, evaluated at that point. What we want is for uh, a system where the, the students, uh, when they reach a level of mastery, then they get the credit. Um, and we think that that will better prepare them to move on to the next stage, whatever it might be. So that's the basic premise of the project and our goal as a group of pilot colleges to develop a business transfer degree that's competency-based, as I just mentioned. It will be completely online, openly licensed, which means that the content will have a an open license and can be used by anyone, and the students will have uh, no uh, cost to use that, um, what's basically the textbook. We're going to work in a six-month term that has multiple start dates, and Melanie will talk in detail about how um, that will work for financial aid. The students will pay the full-time equivalent of two quarters of tuition during that six-month period, so it's $2,667, plus any fees that the college might might have. And then um, the pilot colleges will uh, will uh, give back um, or send $2,040 of that money to Columbia Basin as the fiscal agent for the project. And that's how we'll hire the faculty, as you'll see in, in the coming slides. So students work at their own pace, and they complete as many credits as they're able to during each term. Um, we're going to start in January, which is just coming right up. These are the pilot colleges. Columbia Basin is the lead. And there are a total of nine colleges who are participating right now. And these pilot colleges are contributing um, equally into the uh, development costs of this project and are the first colleges to offer the program to students. We're hoping to build something that will be useful to all the colleges, though, and, and if, uh, to develop processes that can be used by any college either to offer competence-based programs locally or to share other programs or to expand this. So why are we doing this? We're looking at reduced population growth in the 15 to 19-year-olds in the next 10 years, increased growth in 20 to 44-year-olds, and we know we have almost a million adults in Washington who have some college and no degree. So we're looking at a population that are not now coming to our colleges, but who would, we think, benefit from a more flexible completion program like this one. And that link uh, takes you to some very detailed information about those demographics if you're interested. We've been working on this project um, as a system inspired by the work of four colleges who developed some uh, competency-based certificate programs. They're still all going, you know, and they're all, all working right now. Um, this particular project was developed by a system work group 
and uh, is an is a attempt to do a full comprehensive degree program. So as I said, we're looking at students with some college or work experience. They will be assisted by intrusive advisors or proactive advisors who will help them to determine their course load, make sure that they are not signing up for too much, make sure they understand what the project is like uh, or the program is like. And they'll, that uh, initial advising will take place at the college where the student enrolls, but then there are will be completion coaches hired by Columbia Basin and disciplinary faculty, and those will be the um, people who will work directly with the students as they um, enter the program and as they uh, do their work. And we're going to hire full, four full-time faculty and six adjunct faculty uh, by at Columbia Basin to do this work. The courses are 18 of our highest enrollment courses that meet the distribution requirement. And very importantly, they will be transcribed as regular credits, regular courses. They won't be distinguished as competency-based courses on the student's transcript. And um, these courses are being built by our system faculty with um, help of a vendor right now. This is a list of courses. Oh, sorry, uh, the clarify the amounts pay back to CBC. So if um, a college enrolls a student, the college uh, pays Columbia Basin $2,040 for the six-month term. And then there's also a $40 fee for that I'm just getting to for um, access to adaptive testing. So that's the total. Sorry, I didn't see that question right away. And this is Lumen Learning is, is uh, working with us on the process of developing the courses. They are leaders in open educational resources. And they are helping us to build these adaptive assessments that will um, allow, give the student constant feedback on what they're learning and also give constant feedback to the faculty and the completion coaches on how the students are developing. The, it's kind of important to note that the content of these courses is open and free. Um, the adaptive assessments themselves will cost $40 per student per term. So if a student's enrolled for a year, that'll be a total of $80. And that's the cost model that will allow us to um, continue to update and adapt those adaptive assessments. It's the the business model that makes that work. I think a pretty good savings and students spend about $1,200 on books, between eight and 1200 right now. $80 is a pretty good deal. Um, so we're using our system assets. We have these strong transfer agreements. We have a shared course system. Um, all the students will be authenticated into Canvas. And And we'll be able to share the enrollments using those in our other common e-learning tools, the e-tutoring consortium and library reference service. So for the student experience, the student will um, go to the college that, um, that they choose that's offering this uh, pilot, or maybe um, it might be suggested to them by advi an advisor at the college. And then the student will go through an application process. The application process is not uh, designed to uh, limit the number of students in the program, but to make sure that the students understand what they're getting into. And we have a, a real concern that students um, don't find themselves in a six-month commitment for completely online courses. And, and that's not really you know, what they thought they were doing. That student experience also includes an orientation that's managed by the completion coach. Um, as I mentioned, there will be heavy faculty engagement with the students and, and the adaptive testing. And then the grades that the students will get. Oh, I forgot to change the slide. The grades, I think uh, Melanie has a better slide later on. They're A and B, or 4.0, 3.0. And then they can get other grades as per college policy like an incomplete if they're almost done right at the end of the term. Or if, obviously, if they don't ever finish, they'll get a failure. Um, so those, that's, uh, the idea there is that you don't get a C in one of these courses. You have to demonstrate mastery at a high level in order to, uh, to, to prove the competency, your competency you know, in that course. So why pilot as a system? We're sharing the development costs. We're sharing the staffing, including uh, Melanie's uh, work at Columbia Basin on financial aid. And, um, but this also allows the students to belong to the college where they enroll. 
and also a, a, a large factor here is in managing the the uh, faculty contracts for this because the students are working at, at their own pace. It's hard to figure out how many faculty you might need um, when you don't know, uh, you know, at what point students will be taking one of those courses. I've got some research here if you are interested in the pedagogy behind this and the ideas that by working with um, by combination of technology and, and strong interpersonal interact, interactivity, students will do better. Here's a list of the Columbia Basin College employees who are working on this project. Our strategy is to build it at Columbia Basin as the lead institution and then share that process with the other pilot colleges. We know that colleges don't do everything the same way, so we're hoping that that will work um, you know, with only minor modifications at other colleges. What works at Columbia Basin will work elsewhere. I'm going to skip right through these screens, but I want you to know that they're here. These are the ways that um, Columbia Basin is setting up the courses in the schedule, and um, we can come back to these later if uh, that is important. I'm going to skip to, um, I already talked about this. The uh, last important thing that I want to mention is that we have this blog. It's uh, in a, in a listserv, and I just encourage people to um, take a look at this blog. Uh, it's where we are posting all information, and you know sometimes it changes, and we're adding things all the time as we you know kind of roll towards our our uh, our start date. Um, so I'm going to stop here and uh, see if there's any questions about what I've talked about so far. And if not, I'm going to turn it over to okay, um, thanks, Melanie. Okay, thanks, Connie. Um, my name is Melanie Cachado, and I'm at Columbia Basin College. Um, All I right, was hired away, in thanks. January um, to work in the financial aid office here with one of my primary focuses being on the competency-based education program. Um, we've been working uh, pretty closely with Julie Arthur at the Department of Education to try to get some definitions and get our, our, our program structure in place. Um, the information that I'm providing today is a, a little bit tentative in that um, we've been going back and forth with Julie on uh, making sure that our, our program meets all federal aid criteria. Um, federal financial aid is really kind of an antiquated philosophy of of students sitting in chairs for a duration of time, um, kind of the, the standard approach to education. So as uh, education is evolving and becoming more innovative, uh, we're waiting for financial aid practices to kind of catch up. So uh, with that being said, I will have more information in the next week or so, and as Connie mentioned, the CBE blog will, will uh, have all information updates as we have them. We'll also try to send it out on the financial aid uh, listserv, so uh, you'll have several opportunities, hopefully, to get that information. Um, in looking at the first slide, we're going to be defining our academic year. We will have two six-month sessions. The first session will, uh, for this year, begin at the midpoint of the year, so we will begin January 5th and run through the end of June. Uh, the next session will begin at the beginning of July and run through uh, December. So getting started kind of at the midpoint of the year, um, our number of instructional weeks will vary by enrollment entry date. Because we do have three entry dates to the program each session, we have to uh, create three different timelines to um, have options for, for each uh, student entry point. But all entry points meet the minimum annual requirements for um, an academic year. Uh, we also are requiring all students to be enrolled for full time, so there will be no part time attendance. Students can take a minimum of 20 credit hours. Um, however, the idea for the competency base, as, uh, as Connie was stating earlier, is that it allows students to uh, progress through the program quicker. Um, Financially, it also makes more sense for them to take additional credits, but the interaction with um, their faculty and their completion coaches will, will help them pick the right amount of credits for their uh, learning style and their success rate. Um, one of the things that we'll be taking into consideration as we continue to work on the program is 
um, if there are any orientations at the beginning of the session, breaks between sessions, um, et cetera, we'll be taking those into consideration when looking at the number of instructional weeks. So um, more information on that as we, as we have it complete, but we do have the tentative dates for the beginning session out on the blog. Um, because each um, class that a student takes, they're able to progress through at their own speed, um, we'll be looking at each class as a module. Um, they do not necessarily span the entire uh, duration of the session. So a student could take a module and complete it in the first month, or they could have it span the entire session and start at January 5th and not complete it until uh, the end of June. So uh, because there is a variety, um, it is kind of open-ended. We have a start date and an end date to the session as a whole, but each module may have different uh, start and end dates. Um, the, the language there for a payment period uh, course or courses that do not span the entire length of the period of enrollment directly from, from our federal guidance. Um, our program will be looked at as a non-standard term program because we do have the beginning and end dates. Um, they may be of unequal length. Again, students that enter January through June will have a different um, term length than a student that enters February through June. Um, doesn't conform to norm normal quarter or semester schedule, um, and we're going to group our modules together for the entire session. Um, there were some questions when we originally started looking at this program, whether it would be a non-standard term or um, a non-term option, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So a lot of conversation has happened um, from the, the, the beginning conversations about doing the CBE program to where we are at now. And one thing that we want to make sure each institution that is in the pilot program is aware of is that um, each institution will be responsible for processing their own aid for their students enrolled. Um, because of the way our systems function, it will probably be a pretty manual process at first. Um, I know that as far as uh, we're looking at here at Columbia Basin College, I'll be managing those students and uh, hand packaging their aid and, and monitoring their disbursements. Um, students will be coded at admission, and that was some of the slides that uh, Connie kind of jumped over. Um, we do have information there. We have a great team here at Columbia Basin College that's working with um, SBCTC on coding and ensuring that the codes that we utilize are available across all of the campus locations. Um, we'll be utilizing our FAM system. Um, we'll be creating subcodes for the award screen. That way we can track and we can pull information based on those subcodes. Um, the students will be awarded uh, in the same award screen as we have our traditional students awarded. Uh, the, well, I'll go into it in the next screen. The, the awarding will look a little bit different in that they will have two awards for the year that will happen in the uh, one and the three uh, sessions. So, for example, the session that's getting ready to start in January will be B453. That will be our winter session. The next session that we offer will be uh, B561. Um, in addition to that, we'll have the subcodes for tracking. Um, the budgets and procedures will need to reflect each session entry point. So again, like I mentioned before, there are three entry points for each uh, enrollment session. So we'll need to make sure that we have um, the ability to process aid for students for uh, a six-month session, five-month session, and four-month session. Uh, we're not creating new budget codes on CBC's campus. We will uh, manually package these as a budget 99 uh, in the award screen and then uh, just put the appropriate budget code in as we go through. So this is what our budget looks like. We used the approved personal and room and board expenses and prorated it by entry point. So if a student is uh, coming for a full six month session starting in January, it's just essentially two quarters worth of room and board and personal expenses. The tuition and the fees stay the same. 
the room and board and the personal expenses are the only things that prorate over the, the, the course of the session. So this is what I was beginning to talk about earlier. We'll have two sessions each year, our winter session and then the following summer session and the entry codes uh, for each or the subcodes for each entry point. Um, a, B, and C are used here as examples. We'll be working closely with SBCTC to make sure that the, the subcodes we choose um, are, are kind of tied or allocated to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. We have a question. I'm going to go back to the cost of attending. The books and supplies and the cost of attendance, there are no books. It's, uh, the program is an open source program, so uh, the students don't have uh, books that they'll be responsible for purchasing. They don't have to pay for the software. Um, it's something we could consider if we think that there will be other supplies that they will need, but um, we did not calculate that into the budget. So thank you, Tracy. Um, the subcodes, again, um, we'll be defining those as we have them defined on how they're going to look on our campus. We will go ahead and get that information out. So for satisfactory academic progress, uh, one of the things that we will need to do um, and we're going to be working on here pretty shortly is uh, getting a policy set up that is separate and specifically geared for our competency-based education. Um, all students are required to be full-time, so that in theory for our wonderful CBE students, it should help alleviate some um, staff issues. Students will receive an A or B grade to show mastery, or they'll receive an I or an F grade. Um, incompletes will be based on our current campus policy. So at CBC, a student has into, I, I believe, 20 days into the next academic session to complete a grade, or it turns to a, a, an F or a zero. So um, students receiving an I or an F will be held to the same staff uh, policies that we, we currently have, I or an F grade um, does not constitute a grade. It will be uh, not considered in the staff calculation. So if a student essentially takes 20 credits, they get an incomplete in one class, they're automatically on warning. If they get an incomplete or a failing grade in more than one class, their financial aid would automatically be canceled and we'll be creating a petition process uh, for students in that position. If they get an incomplete, the grade gets changed. It would be similar to how our current policies are, uh, where the student's uh, status would change based on the grade change. Uh, looking at return to Title IV and, and getting some of our, our dates set up, we will be setting a census date for each session based on entry points. So um, for our session that's beginning in January, we will have three census dates. Um, those will be added to this calendar. Um, we'll be working with our records office and uh, getting those set shortly. Uh, this just gives you a quick count of calendar days and then the 60% date for each entry point. Um, we'll be looking into um, the withdrawals for based on uh, modular programs and we'll provide any updates that we have um, I, I sound pretty tentative right now because we are still waiting to, to finalize some conversations with, with Julie at the Department of Education um, to make sure that everything that we're presenting is uh, going to be approved and kind of checked off by the Department of Ed. So if I sound tentative um, or, or stating that we'll report back a lot, that's, that's kind of why. Um, so this is still evolving and January is coming quickly, so we are trying to get it to evolve quickly, but there are some unanswered questions, some discussions that are still going on. Um, we've contacted WASAC and asked them what the state need grants will look like for the, the upcoming year. It seems logical that we would offer state need grants to this population of students based on a semester type award um, with two awards per year instead of um, a quarterly award amount. Um, however, we also don't know then how that would look for uh, reporting purposes and how it may impact the interim report and the unit record. So waiting for guidance from them uh, on that. Um, 
Also, the state authorization for each institution, we want to make sure that each school is thinking about if they get out-of-state students, making sure that they're authorized to offer a program in whatever state that the student is coming to them from. Uh, something you can probably talk to um, VPI or, or whoever deals with the um, authorizations on your campus. Um, something else just to be aware of, CBC has filed a substantive change. Um, just make sure that each individual institution is uh, aware that you will need to file that with your accreditors to make sure that the uh, program is approved to be offered in a new delivery method. Same program, different delivery methods, so we have to make that uh, update. Um, a question that we've posed through our records office, and they are looking into this with the clearinghouse. Uh, if we have loan borrowers at our school and they're getting loans paid out in sessions B453 and B561, does that make it look like they are not attending in B454? Uh, uh, will they still be, will their session be reported as a six month session showing continuous enrollment um, so that they will not look like they're going into repayment on their student loans or entering their grace period? So again, something that our records office is, is diligently looking into. Um, I mentioned that we're talking to Julie Arthur and some of the questions that she's uh, just giving us the final, final nod on are whether we will continue to move forward as a non-standard term versus a non-term. We feel pretty confident with that, but um, there was some language that she was um, looking at in how our, how our uh, proposal was written, how our program was written. So she's uh, been looking into that for us and we'll report back next week. So I'm hoping by the end of next week we'll have some good um, kind of final, final word from the Department of Ed that makes us all feel confident moving forward. Um, Want to make sure that our academic program meets all financial aid criteria. So as we've been going through it, um, making sure that our, our academic year, our program periods, our entry dates, our, um, our, our dates that we're scheduling um, are all set. Okay, we have a, another question. Does that approval from Department of Ed cover all pilot institutions or just CBC? Because the program is being set up um, the same across the institutions, I mean, there will be variances in how it is delivered, um, but it would it would cover all institutions as long as they are not deviating from, um, like if we're approved as a non-standard term with uh, modules and we're delivering it in one six-month session with three entry points, then I think it would cover all institutions that are, that are approaching it that way. And would we be updating our PPA? You know, I don't believe so. I know that our PPA is due for renewal and we are uh, submitting it in December. Our director, Ben Buse, is actually out today, but that's a question I can pose to him. Um, we have not discussed updating our PPA based on that, um, but yes, we would definitely need to ask. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take note of that. I can't see whose question that is. I'll tell you what, I will take a note of that and report back on the blog. Thanks, Tracy. And it, it looks like um, Connie responded that each college does have to submit a substantive change to the NWCCU. Um, so that's what we were talking about earlier. The, the CBC has already done that, but each uh, pilot college will need to do that. So um, that will be required. I'm just taking a quick note based on Tracy's question. And um, we will go ahead and update the blog with this information next week as we have it. Thanks so much, Tracy. Uh, Oh, and Connie says, we have worked on a template for the substantive change for each college. Excellent. So um, the great part about uh, CBC, CBC kind of spearheading this is we're trying to do as much of the groundwork as we can and get it out to the other institutions 
Um, not saying you have to do everything exactly as we're doing it, but we sure hope we can we can make it easier for for everyone to um, follow follow our initial lead. Uh, next steps again, we're working with the SBCTC folks on figuring out how to best utilize FAM for this uh, system. It's kind of challenging in that we're taking a system that's currently set up for our regular academic year, and we're trying to make it do both our our regular financial aid administration as well as uh, administering aid for the CBE program. I feel confident that we'll figure out a way. Um, I'm hopeful that we have a good uh, I don't I don't want to jinx us, but a good kind of nice small cohort to start uh, this first session with, so that we can learn and grow. Uh, with our students and, and figure out how to best utilize our system. We're going to need to create internal tracking for all of these CBE students. Currently, we're just anticipating spreadsheet in the beginning, hence why we want kind of a, a, good, a good solid group uh, in the beginning. Um, we'll, be need, we'll need to collect program data and uh, be able to really make sure that we're providing all of the tools that our students need to be successful. Um, the policies and procedures will be coming soon. Um, we'll create a separate satisfactory academic progress, um, separate appeal process, and we'll look at the withdrawal and the return of funds should that be, should that be needed. Um, we're going to be creating a competency-based education priority deadlines uh, calendar for financial aid purposes. I have heard uh, some schools say uh, that right now they're already past their priority deadline for, beginning, uh, for students to begin school in January. Um, CBC's approach is that if a student applies for financial aid and is entering into the CBE program, we will get them ready to enter the program. After we get through this initial uh, session, we will look at putting our priority dates in line with the rest of our financial aid priority dates and deadlines, and students will be expected to uh, get their FAFSAs in, um, get their data sheets in by April 15th to be ready to begin in the uh, winter, maybe after April 15th, and then October 15th to begin, uh, I'm sorry, October 15th to begin in, in the winter and April 15th to begin in the summer. So um, we're, we're being much more flexible with our dates and deadlines for this first round um, because we are jumping off in January and we're just getting ready to start advertising the program. We want to um, kind of prioritize some of these CBE students, and um, I'm I'm dedicated to, to working with this population. So you, you'll want to take the conversation back to your financial aid offices and see um, what it's going to look like for individuals in your office to handle the the competency base. Are you going to have a point person? And if so, it would be great to have them included in these conversations. So um, we can all kind of kind of talk about that. Um, Tracy asked, with the change for NWCCU approval, how can we award financial aid in the duration? We need to get clarification from Julie, DOE, that we would be okay to award. Okay, Tracy, I'll ask that question. Um, you're meaning to award in January if the change isn't approved as of yet, I'm assuming? Okay. So I have a phone call scheduled with Julie uh, early next week, and I will ask that exact question, and then I'll report back. Okay, so um, that's all I have. I would uh, really love to hear people's feedback or if there are other questions. Um, this is a work in progress, so I'm very open to suggestions. I've been working with uh, the CTC uh, system since January, so I'm still learning what FAM is and isn't capable of, but I do feel very optimistic that we'll be able to um, utilize it. It might be a little more manual than, than we all like sometimes, but I think we'll be able to utilize the system and, and get, this, get this program moving until we're into people soft.
Any questions? Any comments? Uh, Melanie, are are you going to um, give a report back on the listserv or on the blog? Uh, I'll probably might be, whatever I, I don't know. whatever I send to the blog. I'll Whatever I send to the blog, I will um, send out on the financial aid listserv and the CBE listserv as well. Great, thank you. There's a question from Kim at TCC saying, will this process be automated in PeopleSoft? Uh, Kim, I have to be quite honest. I We have not really tackled what it's going to look like in PeopleSoft. We did have um, a meeting a couple months ago with Kim Wyzerski and a couple other folks with SDCTC. And she felt pretty confident that it was going to be much easier, um, that Sam really had parameters that were, were going to limit how we were able to do this, and that um, as we transition to PeopleSoft, uh, that it should be easier to get the system to function for, for both types of aid programs we're trying to disperse. So I have hope. Yes, it is very good news. <laughs> Other questions? This is Connie. I was going to add that we have been talking with uh, CTC Link staff and State Board Bellevue all along on you know how how this will work in Legacy System plus CTC Link, and uh, a lot of those CTC Link questions have yet to be answered or dealt with um, you know, because of the stage we are with the CTC Link project. But but everybody's you know quite aware of. The you know the, what's going on and and so far uh, you know there there haven't been any red flags you know it'll be different and we'll have to do some kind of combination work pr probably um, oh well individual colleges won't but for reporting for instance but uh, you know there, there's there's a fair fairly high level of confidence that this is going to be positive in CTC Link. Well, and Connie, just to piggyback that, uh, totally aside from competency-based education, um, I think that our CTC link uh, transition to PeopleSoft is going to open up a lot of avenues, a lot of um, taking the manual out of, out of some of our processing. So um, I think that it's going to be an exciting transition. Okay, well, I um, thank you for letting me share a little bit about where we're at with financial aid. Um, my email address is, um, I'm going to go back to the slide that has my contact information. And oops, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in there. Um, so I encourage you to, to email, call as you have questions, and I will provide updates. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Connie. And I will. Uh, provide as much information out on um, the different listservs and on the blog as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melanie, and, and thanks everyone for attending this. Um, the slides and the recording from this session will be put on the blog, and uh, so if, if you want to I know we went kind of fast <laughs> and also skipped through some of those slides just, just for um, the t uh, purposes of time. But uh, please um, you know, direct anyone who has questions to Melanie if they're specific to financial aid, to Kathy Clary if um, they are about student services, and, and to me if there are some overall questions. We do, of course, have, as mentioned, some, th some things that are still unresolved or up in the air and new questions all the time, but we are very interested in getting feedback, questions, comments right now um, so that we can address any any um, shortfalls or any um, you know confusion now as opposed to you know on January 2nd would be less desirable. Um, it is a tight timeline and uh, it is a pilot you know so I think that's important that we keep remembering that this is a this is a test 
a test run, and so um, you know we expect uh, some of the things that we try, um, you know, might not be the best in the long run, and and once we know that, we'll fix it and we'll change it. So uh, thank you for attending, and uh, if you have any other questions. I'll, I'll wait just a second and then I'll sign off. Let you get back to your other work.